Uh, Helen, thank you very much indeed, and I thank you to Rothschilds for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, I don't want to alarm you with my f title of my uh, talk today. Um, I'm not going to talk for 30 minutes on quantum mechanics. Um, what I will say, however, though, is that quantum biology is the effect of quantum mechanics in biological systems. And what's quantum mechanics? Well, that's that weird and wonderful world of physics, of atoms and subatomic particles that don't do the sorts of things that we learnt about at school. They're very small. Everything happens very, very quickly indeed. But today I'm going to, to constrain my, my uh, discussion to light and magnetic fields. So that's the end of the quantum mechanics. So somebody that did know a lot about quantum mechanics was Albert Einstein, and he said, if at first an idea is not absurd, then there is no hope. So I'll take you to another absurd idea, and this was Professor John Morgan, a world-renowned professor in cannabinoid science at a conference held by the National Institute of Drug Abuse in New York in 1998, and he said this, doesn't Dr. Guy know that CBD is an inert component of the cannabis plant, and all the pharmacological and therapeutic properties of cannabis can be attributed to THC. Dr. Guy was sitting in the audience and stood up and put him right, right on it. But if we, uh, if we fast forward from this rather absurd idea, by 2014, we had started large-scale clinical trials of Epidial XR CBD product in Dravet syndrome. This is catastrophic, life-threatening epilepsy in children. By 2016, we had announced positive results from the Dravet study. By a little bit later in the year, we got positive results from Lennox Gastro syndrome, another catastrophic uh, epilepsy syndrome in children. And by April 2019, uh, we had a unanimous vote from the FDA advisory committee, which waved through our product for subsequent approval. Uh, Epidiolex was approved on the 25th of June 2018, and this is a quote from the, from the FDA's press release that they approved um, uh, Epidiolex for both of, those, uh, both of those syndromes. And then two years later, we added another one, tuberous sclerosis complex, um, more behavioral disorder, but a very rare genetic dis disease. So as many of you will know, uh, in biotech, news creates uh, fluctuations in stock prices. And after we announced our first, uh, uh, first positive phase three trial, our share price went up 139% in, in three hours. And in the eight years that we were on uh, NASDAQ, uh, we managed to multiply our share price by 26 times. And you might say, well, what was that final uplift, that premium at the end? Well, after a number of, uh, of rejections, we turned them down on a number of occasions. Our board accepted an offer from Jazz Pharma to buy our company for $7.2 billion. Uh, that was announced in February, and as you know how things work in the US, very quick, very fast, very efficient, uh, the deal was done by the 5th of, 5th of May. So do I have any more absurd ideas up my sleeve? I've become known as the purveyor of absurd ideas. Um, here's a few. Could we treat diabetes and COVID just by shining torches at patients? Um, can we reprogram cancer cells to return to normal cells, not try and kill them, but say, tell them to go back to being normal cells? Can I tune the cellular energetics, the energy profile in a cell, to improve the healthy longevity, not necessarily making people live longer, but fitter for longer, and decrease uh, degenerative disorders? Can I obtain morbidity compression, or can we, our, our team do that so you stay healthier to longer in your, uh, later in your years? And by the way, this is still conjecture. Are there quantum effects in biology? What's more, can we do that without using chemicals nor genetic manipulation? So this is where we're in new ground. From the last 90 years or so, most of the medicines to do with, with, with chem chemicals, the last 20 years or so, genetics. So in order to convince you and convince other people that there's some worth in these absurd ideas, I have to call on this chap. Now, this chap, some of you will recognize, is the brush salesman. And if the brush salesman on the doorstep asks a question of the housewife, to which the answer is no, he has lost his sale. Do you have dust? No, sale's gone. Science is very much the same way. If I produce a result, fantastic as it may seem, but it doesn't seem plausible to my scientific audience, they will reject the result, they will reject the, the, the data. So what we have to do is create scientific plausibility when you're moving into new areas of science. For example, making a medicine out of a cannabis extract. Um, and the way we do this is by providing acceptable stacking, stepping stones. 
break the journey down for the scientists from what he accepts at the moment through a series of reasonable stepping stones that they could accept as true and reasonable. And after a while, the, the enlightened ones will say, well, if that, that and that's true, have you asked this question? You say, it's interesting you asked that, Professor. I asked it last week, and here's the results. So we have to lead people through that stepping stone of acceptability. So I'm going to offer you a few stepping stones to help you get to some acceptance of our absurd ideas earlier on. And this is one of my favourites. It's an ugly little thing. It's, uh, it's a tardigrad. Some of you might know what a tardigrad is. It's about a half a millimetre long. Uh, you find them top of mountains, bottom of the sea. But it has some remarkable cap capabilities. It can survive in temperatures down to minus 272 degrees and up to 150 degrees, only for short periods. It will survive hundreds of times the lethal dose of radiation. It survives the vacuum in space. They stayed outside the spaceship, the uh, Photon M3, in 2007 for 12 days, and over half of them, 68% of them, survived. They'll take six times the pressure of the deepest oceans. That's about 6,000 6, times the pressure we're sitting in now. And if there's no oxygen, they basically slow their metabolism down to next to nothing. But the real piece de resistance, I think, for the tardigrad is if you dry it up, if you desiccate it completely and up to periods of 10 years, you just add water and it comes back to life. This is a clever little uh, chap and we want to know more about him. Now, here's another one. You probably all recognize the Alaskan wood frog. Um, but you know in Alaska it gets pretty cold each winter. So what happens to this little frog is, is this. <laughs> he freezes solid. He or she freezes solid for about seven months of the year. And then in the spring the sun comes out, thaws out slowly, and off he goes again. How's he doing that? We can't do that. We couldn't do what the tardigrad did. But the one that really takes the biscuit in terms of longevity, and that is living longer, is uh, Chiritopsis. Now, Chiritopsis is a rather interesting jellyfish. When it gets to maturity, under certain conditions, it just goes straight back to being a juvenile polyp again, and it becomes a young jellyfish again. And it keeps doing that time and time again, and is known as the immortal jellyfish. Now, here comes one of my favorites, and this is planaria. Any of you who have a fish tank, you'll know you'll find them in the bottom there. Planaria is a little flat worm about a, a centimetre centimeter long. And it's been known for about 100 years that if you cut planaria in half, the head grows a new tail. Well, lizards do that, we know that. But interestingly enough, with this one, it, the tail grows a new head. And um, the world record was to cut a planaria into 246 bits, and you got 246 complete intact planaria. Okay? So in this case, we've cut the planaria into, th into three bits. The top one, the head, grows a tail and the middle bits grow into full planaria. Now, we can teach planaria, planaria behavior, uh, behavior searching uh, nutrients, for example. So the one at the top, when it grows a new tail, it continues to exhibit that behavior that it learned. Now, I know you know what I'm going to say next. The bits in the middle and the tail can do the same. So the memory of behavior exists not, only, not in the brain of this, this uh, organism, but actually in its somatic cells. And we've commissioned some work to look at exactly what type of cells and how many cells you need to be able to do this. Some of you might relate this to the transplant uh, environment where some transplant patients think they've taken on behavior or, or, or the personality of their donor. So it has fantastic regeneration and memory cap capabilities. Now, how does it do this? It's not to do with genetics. Like my colleague, Mike Levine, at Tufts University has been working on this for a long time and basically says that these planaria and all of us produce a bioelectric template, like a blueprint, around which your cells will form. And the stronger that template, the better they'll form. What Mike's been able to do, though, is, is to alter that bioelectric template. So when you alter the bioelectric template, what you get when you cut a planaria in half is this one, the two-headed planaria. Okay? And Mike has also produced three-headed planaria. The genetics of these are exactly the same. What you've changed is the bioelectrics of this, of this worm. So many of you might know the, uh, the traveling salesman problem. This is a problem to work out the shortest distance and the cheapest way to get your salesman from city to city, uh, in this case, around the United States. It first was brought up in 1832 in a salesman manual and became a mathematical issue in about the 1930s. Every time you add a new city, you add an exponential number of extra options to, get, to travel between the cities. 
And some French uh, authors in 2014 worked out that if you had 61 cities, the number of routes that you would have is equivalent to about the same number of molecules in the universe. And that if you took a microsecond to work out each route, it would take the same number of time that the universe has been in existence. This is a really difficult problem. It challenges the most powerful computers in the world, the ones using 85,000 watts. You're all using about 20, 20 watts to think and listen to me, if hopefully you are. Um, but this is a real challenging problem. But let me introduce you to this little creature. This is a slime mold, physerum. Now, physerum is, is visible with the naked eye. It's a single cell. You can see it. It's got lots of um, nuclei, but it's a single cell. And our colleague, uh, Masashi Aoni, at Kyo University in Japan, has put one of these in what looks like an old daisy wheel of a typewriter, if you, if you remember those. This is a 64 hub and spoke arrangement. And there's nutrient in all of them. And left to its own devices, the physarium will grow into, into each of those. But what he can then do, physarium hates the light. It likes the dark. That's why it's a sl slime mold. He can make some of those wings dark and some of them light. The dark ones are effectively the cities on the traveling salesman. And what physarium does is it works out the quickest, cheapest, less energy efficient route, most energy efficient route, to be able to occupy, the, in this case, eight cities. And this was then uh, picked up by Nature in 2018. And Amoeba just found an entirely new way to solve a classic computing problem. So cells not only have good memory, a blueprint of what they should look like, what the whole organism should look like, how they used to behave before I had my head chopped off, but also they can work out problems which are way beyond our capability. And what was all more interesting here is as you added an extra spoke, an extra city, it, the time taken for the planarian, uh, for, for Physorium to work this out was not exponential, it was linear. It took exactly the same amount of time for each time you added an, an extra city. So although it's not a quantum computer, it's behaving like a quantum com computer. So let me take you on to Xenobots. Now, we take, uh, Mike and our, uh, and, and our group take um, skin cells from the embryo of a Xen uh, Xenopus frog. So this is an African Xenopus frog. And you put them into a dish together, and after a while, they self-assemble. And they assemble themselves in groups of about 500 to 1,000 cells. And they begin to move around, because they produce little hairs on the outside like cilia. These are just skin cells. But they then move around, they start to behave. They've got no brain, no reproductive capability. They were like biological robots, OK? But what is even more interesting is if you then, with these grown uh, xenobots, might be nine or 10 days old, if you add another pile of uh, xenopus frog embryo skin cells, they do this. Sorry, this is, they do this. They go around and make these uh, skin cells into little piles. And as the piles get bigger, they go round and round and make them larger, and they produce new xenobots. And this is called kinematic self-replication. These are just skin cells, OK? Very biddable in terms of research. But what Mike and his team has done, and he's gone a little bit further, he's taken lung cells from the trachea of humans, and he's produced what we call anthrobots. Now, in this video here, what you see, and we're going to repeat it in a little while, what you see is an anthrobot working its way down a scratch that's been made on a brain cell, on a nerve cell. Okay? And over 72 hours, the anthrobot joins that scratch together and heals it. We've no idea how it knows how to do that, but that's what it does. If you just run the video one more time, please, things. There it is. This is a semi-synthetic biological entity which is now going down a scratch in a, in a brain cell and repairing it. And you can think about the options for the future of these, uh, these little anthrobots eating away uh, atherosclerotic plaque, uh, taking away all sorts of issues that are going on. So if we move on slide. So the theme today is about aging, but it also brings up the question of what is aging? So is it this chap? So he's 96 years old. I think he's doing pretty well. He's very old. He's aged, but he's aged well. Was it this chap? He's only 17 years old. He has something called progeria, and he's not aging well at all. In our foundation, however, we're rather more concerned about this one. NASA and the other, health, uh, the other space agencies around the world now accept fully that astronauts returning from space have aged, and aged dramatically. And they put that down to 
uh, poor mitochondrial function. Now, I'll come to back to the word mitochondrial, don't worry about that. But that's what's happening with these chaps, and we're involved with some research to try and put that right. So another way of thinking about aging is not sort of looking at them and see how well they're aging, is to work out whether your biological age is actually greater than your, your chronological age. And a chap called Steve Horvath over at uh, uh, UCLA has analysed tissue data from lots of organs from 348 mammals and come up with something called the epigenetic clock. And I know that uh, Wolf is going to talk to you about epigenetics in, in a little while. Suffice to say, we're able now to, to understand what the biological age of somebody is and to see whether it's different from their, from their chronological age. Now, there are an awful lot of different areas of science that are looking at ageing and looking at the causes of ageing. But I'm just going to focus on this one here, mitochondrial dysfunction. I did say I was going to talk to you a little bit about mitochondria. Excuse, excuse me. So this is the only biology lesson in this, in this, in this presentation, I hope. So this is mitochondria. Every cell has them. And you, if you may remember from school, they were called the powerhouse of the cell. And they produce energy, all the energy in your body, most of it. Most of it relies on these little things that sit inside your cells. And they produce something, the energy that they produce is in the form of something called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. What is interesting is that you are all producing about 60 kilos a day of ATP. It's that important. You produce it, gets used up, they produce it again and goes round and round. The molecules and the constructs within the uh, uh, um, mitochondria are light sensitive molecules. And mitochondria are involved with inflammation, diabetes, cell death and regeneration. In cancer, you see in many, many cancers, you see mitochondrial DNA mutations. And they have a significant role in aging, one of the, one of the most significant roles in aging. But in addition to their energy production, they're also responsible for communication and information. And, and some of that information is exchanged with something we call biophotons. Photon is a small package of light. They come from the sun. And uh, we have been experimenting here. So here's just a little bit of experimentation. We took three test tubes. They're cuvettes. And the bluish area is, it contains mitochondria, a separated mitochondria. We have a little oxygen probe to see how much oxygen they're using up, because that's what they need to produce energy. And the one on the left is shielded from the other two. And when we put a, drug, a chemical in that really upsets mitochondria, they get really upset by this, and their oxygen consumption goes down, nothing happens to the one on the left, but the one on the right does about the same. And there's just fresh air in between. So the modern pharmaceutical industry of the last 80 or 90 years has worked almost entirely on chemicals and the passage of chemicals. And here's a message going between mitochondria with this fresh air in between. And we think that that's what's transmitting the memory are these biophotons, light that your own body produces. You're all producing lots of light at the moment within your own bodies. This isn't new. Alexander Gershwitz demonstrated this with the onion root experiment in 1923. Now, in this room here, you're being bathed by about 10 to the power of 15 photons per square centimetre per second. It's normal day sunlight. What we're looking for is 10. That's 14 orders of magnitude lower. And uh, what we've managed to do at Harwell, where we have a work with the Central Laser Laboratories there, is we've built a detector that can detect individual photons. Now, these photons are coming from mitochondria saying, help, I'm in trouble, giving a message to the next one saying, this is the problem, this is possibly the solution, and here's a little bit of energy to get on with it. So what we're hoping to do is be able to characterise these uh, photons coming from distressed organelles and, and cells, emulate them with our lasers, which we can do, and then target those back at other cells in the body and reprogram them. And, some, and for a number of years, we have called this mitotuning, to retune the fundamental energetics of the, of the body. So how do I know that light might have some impact on, on these processes? Well, uh, Glenn Jeffrey and colleagues at uh, UCL and uh, Moorfields Eye Hospital, they shone red light of uh, 670 nanometers. So this is red light onto the backs of volunteers, two groups. Some had their light, some, some didn't. And it was a 15-minute exposure. That's all it was. They then did a glucose tolerance test. They gave them a lot of glucose and measured their blood levels to see how high their glucose would go. The group that had received the red light on their back, their glucose levels were 27% lower than the group that hadn't. And that's after 15-minute exposure of red light on the back. 
They also expired more carbon dioxide and produced more ATP. In other words, their mitochondria were working a lot, lot, a lot harder. Now, during COVID, uh, our colleague uh, Margaret Ahmed at the Sorbonne started to treat patients with infrared light or near-infrared light, 734 uh, nanometers, with a light panel, which you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, about 30 pounds on eBay, um, and projecting it through the chest of the patients. If I shine red light at this wavelength through your chest, about 8% will come out the other side. So red light does go all the way through you. And what they were able to see in this top paper was that they could decrease the inflammation of the lung by shining this red light through, through the patient twice, twice a day. And then in a subsequent study with her group and our group, we were able to measure chemical markers in the body that also told us that what was going on is that we were decreasing the inflammation in these, in, in, in these patients just by shining red light through them. Now, both of those are instances of where we're shining light at the patient's body directly. On the left-hand side here, you see a light being shone on an area of wound which is, uh, was not healed. It's a very nasty wound that hasn't healed. But that wound is covered with a gel, and you can see it on the right-hand side, a little gel on the top. So the light is shone onto the gel. The gel then fluoresces. It turns the photons from one wavelength and one power into others, which then penetrate the skin. And that improves the wound healing markedly and far, far better than if you just shone the light on the skin. This is a pure quantum effect of the fluorescence of that gel, and we've been involved in the research on this for a couple of, a couple of years now. Now, you might think this is all really new, uh, very new to you, but this guy, Niels Finsen, uh, wouldn't agree with you. He was born in the Faroe Islands in 1860, and in 1903, he received the Nobel Prize. And what do you think he got the Nobel Prize for? For treating a really nasty skin condition called uh, lupus vulgaris with light, 1903. That was ultraviolet light, and that was Niels Finson. And just last week, we were very proud to tell you that our PhD student had this paper accepted for publication, and the take-home message was this, is that these results suggest that near-infrared light modulates cellular chemistry, arresting the proliferation of cancer cells via senescence, the cells get old, uh, senescence induction, while sparing non-cancer cells. So the red light was killing the cancer cells, but not killing the normal cells. Very interesting finding. This has taken, got a lot of interest. Now, talking about cancer and staying with the, the thoughts of cancer, this is an oncomagnetic helmet. Now, Martin Sharp and his group at the Houston Methodist Hospital in, in, in the United States have made this rather horrific-looking device on the left, which is a helmet on which they've strapped three rather potent oscillating magnets. And they used it to treat a patient with glioma. And as you know, glioma is an extremely aggressive brain tumour. And... As you can see from the graph, and it's the only graphics in the, in, in the talk, the size of the tumour was going up and up until the yellow area where he started the treatment and the size of the tumour went way down. Now, this is a very early, very preliminary result, but this is from the impact of oscillating magnets acting on the, on the cells within, within this tumour. So, in conclusion, um, nature has some extraordinary capabilities that we don't yet have. Uh, in terms of survival, regeneration, and, and longevity. It's interesting, though, that the animals and creatures that can do that share very many uh, similar cell types to, to humans. So why can't humans do this? We've shown you that the cells can have memory, not only of structure, but function, and could carry with them behavior, not necessarily brain cells. We've shown you that cells are very smart, so... F so they may have the memory of where they came from and what they're meant to do, but could sort out a new problem themselves, just like those little xenobots and the anthrobots. Uh, we can now demonstrate that quantum effects can alter and harness fundamental functions in cells. These treatments with light and magnetic therapies, we're just at the beginning of beginning and to unravel how can we get human cells to adopt some of the extraordinary capabilities of some of these animals that are already in nature. And on our targets are things like neurodegeneration, diabetes, cancer, aging, and more important, morbidity compression. Can you be healthier longer later into life and decrease that last decade of Ill, Ill health? With that, I hope I've given you a glimpse of medicine of the future. Some of this is going to be on my time. It's going to be 20, 30 years from now, but it's already started. 
and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. <laughs>